Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi. Today we're going to discuss chronic myelogenous leukemia. I have the pleasure of being with Dr. Javier Pena, assistant professor of medicine at the Lee Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. He's originally from Spain, uh, but he has done his training at the very prestigious Memorial Sloan Kettering. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for being here, too. Dr. Pena, what is CML? Well, CML is a myeloproliferative disorder characterized by the expansion of uh, uh, all the myeloid progenitors, including uh, the, the more mature and the more uh, immature ones that really classically present as a really uh, profound or severe uh, leukocytosis in the peripheral blood smear. I see. So in CML, the chromosome 9 joins the chromosome 22. Would you please explain what that is and what that causes? Well, this is the classical uh, translocation called the Philadelphia chromosomes because put together a piece of uh, chromosome 9 and 22. And in this chromosome, there is two genes called BCR and ABLE that when they get together, really produce a, what we call a constitutive activate tyrosine kinase. And what is this in a more uh, plain word? Well, it's an enzyme that makes cells to proliferate in such a degree that really start to grow uh, very, very uh, profoundly in the bone marrow as well in the peripheral blood. I see. So, you know, when our patients hear the word leukemia, obviously it's a very scary term. How is CML different from acute leukemia? That, that's a great, great question, and we try to really discuss with our patient at the first visit. There is no doubt leukemia is a general term and is applied for um, multiple really entities. In this case, we are talking about chronic leukemia, and this is really completely different from acute one in the sense that patient won't be um, exposed to, to die in the first month without therapy. Rather, they, they can really evolve to more advanced phase of the disease in the years to come, but not necessarily in the first uh, weeks or months from the diagnosis. I see. So generally speaking, how does one come to be diagnosed with CML? That's also very classical. Many patients can go to the doctors in an asymptomatic state, and they really even have like a, a periodical or routine uh, physical exam that includes a CBC. But many other patients start to present with the classical symptoms of uh, night nice sweats, fatigue, uh, severe, uh, you know, lack of appetite, and many people. And it's very classical presentation of the disease will um, describe what they call early society. They start to eat, they feel full, and they, but they still really want to eat more. And this is because the classical you know, onset of uh, splenomegaly, who pulls the stomach in the way that patients don't have a space for, for eating more. I see, so you know, nowadays obviously we have very good treatments, but if one were not to be treated for CML, what would be the natural history of the disease? What would happen? The natural history of CML was described many years ago before the era of tyrosine kinase inhibitor that we'll talk about later, right? But pretty much it's a chronic phase in self that is around five to six years on duration, followed by an accelerated phase where the disease starts to transform through a very specific uh, mutations and uh, genetic anormalities that the stem cells of CML acquire. Finally, and unfortunately, these patients end up in an acute phase would really, really most of the time uh, will really terminate in a, in a bad way with, uh, in, in these patients. So you mentioned the, the phases which are so important, but just to break it down again, what is the difference specifically between the chronic, accelerated, and blastic phase? It's pretty much, there is a couple of criteria, the WHO is the one that we use, the MD mm -hmm. Anderson, but pretty much is the percentage of blast that we see in the bone marrow in the peripheral blood, as well of some uh, presence of uh, thrombocytosis, elevation of platelets, or even thrombocytopenia, the uh, decrease of the platelets count. Pretty much, depending on the number, and, and more than 10 to 15 percent or we start to really call a serial phase and definitely more than 20% of blast in the bone marrow is what is the definition, the classical definition of uh, blast phase. So that would all be almost treated like an acute leukemia? That's then. correct. It's very interesting, as you know, that the 20 or 30% has been uh, debatable by the mm -hmm. WHO classification uh, from, the, from the MDS uh, entities, but in general we really move um, in, in the WHO is considered more than 30%, but we now, between 20 and 30%, you may consider already a, 
and a more aggressive disease. I see. Are there any risk factors that predispose one to developing CML? The only risk factor that's been uh, proven is um, radiation, ionizing radiation, mm -hmm. and there's the only one that has been proven has some relation with this condition. I see. What about genetic counseling? Is there a time that's appropriate for family members yeah. to seek genetic counseling? This is a counseling? very, very common question that our patient really uh, ask in first visit as they they've been told that they have a genetic mutation and they always ask what about this mutation is going to be uh, you know is going to be in my kids or in my descendants well uh, interestingly this is not a genetic um, um, disease means that uh, the kids won't really uh, have the, this problem because happening in a very uh, a specific stem cell, a hematopoietic stem cell, but not in the rest of the cells. And for the reason, there is no any indication of genetic counseling. I see. So what are some important tests that you do send? Would, would you please explain what FISH and PCR is? Right. And um, the, the classic w way that uh, CML has been diagnosed for many years is a conventional cytogenetic when we really get cells, uh, replicating cells, they get break down in a, in a petri dish and then all the chromosomes are spread in a smear and then you just count the chromosomes and then you find how many Philadelphia chromosomes you, you really can find most of the time out of the 20 metaphases. This is the classical way that has been diagnosed CML since the 60s when they were mm -hmm. initially described. But with the incorporation of new techniques that is fluorescent inside of hybridization where you have specific probes that really bind to BCR and ABLE you can really easily uh, characterize this translocation through um, um, without cells um, replicating. And in this way, it's a more convenient way to really have this test done in the peripheral blood where cells most of the time don't replicate as much. Beside these two levels, and I would say the first level is the, the classical uh, complete blood counts, the second level is the cytogenetic assessment by cytogenetic conventional cytogenetic office. The third one is the, uh, the more specific one for um, CML, and is the RT-PCR, the quantitative PCR, uh, trying to detect the amount of BCR-able product, the transcript that we call. And this is really a unique example uh, about in this disease, we can really detect very, very small amount of, of, of the disease in, in the peripheral blood or in the, bone, in the bone marrow without even having any, any evidence of, of disease. So all these tests can be done via blood stick, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Then Although, they, you're right, they can be done, and most of the time are done uh, once that the patient is already in control, and we will discuss later about the milestones. Most of the time can be done in the peripheral blood, and you can argue that a diagnosis can be done the first time that the patient encountered this doctor. But we understand and we believe, and um, people who, like me who, who really work with CML, that a bone marrow is very important to be done at the beginning. And why is that? Because mm -hmm. we want to understand what else besides uh, 922 translocation is there. There may be another translocation or another abnormalities that they can give us some clues about how aggressive this disease is going to behave in the future. I see. So within the translocation itself, you look for some subtypes of translocations within that, don't you? And what are those? The translocation is always the 922, mm -hmm. right? There is a, a pretty much the translocation. There is something called variant translocation that can have a three uh, chromosomes instead of two. It's called the variant uh, translocation. They are very, very rare. What you're referring to is the different transcript that BCRA will can, uh, you know, originate. Right. And classically, we call them the B3A2 and the B2A2, depending on the pieces of the BCR enabled that they get together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. These really get rise a P210 kilo protein, and, and it's kind of 50 50, and there is no really any evidence that any of those translocations respond in different way to the therapies, the current therapies. There's another, um, translo uh, not translocation, but transcript that call is a P190 kilo protein that is called from the from the E1A2 size of the BCR enabled uh, genes, who classically is seen in the pH positive acute lymphoblastic leukemia and in very very rare cases of a chronic myeloleukemia. I see. Should one's diet change when they've been diagnosed with CML, or doesn't matter? Diet is not being involved in the etiopathogenesis of this condition, nor is something that can affect how this uh, condition is being treated. Being said that, there is a specific, uh, you know, fruits or uh, foods that won't be um, 
advisable when checking with the guys and the classical one is the grapefruit. Oh, because right. pretty much interaction with uh, certain um, enzymes in the in the liver that won't really uh, you know allow the the drug to be effective. I see. So uh, we'll get into this more in detail when we talk about the treatment. But please, again, what mi when you said milestones, what are you referring to? That's so important. We are talking about milestones, and I think uh, we always discuss with my patient in first BC that the more important thing in the life of a patient that is being diagnosed with CML is the first. 12 to 18 months of his life. Why? Because we want to make sure that certain milestones, certain goals are achieved. And if we do so and we really uh, achieve these goals, we now that the patient can be what we've been called for many years a safe heaven. And it's a situation where the likelihood of progression is extremely low, if not impossible. What are those milestones that the classical one um, described by the, the NCCN guidelines and the ELN. But pretty much is the achievement of a complete hematologic response by three months, the achievement of a reasonable cytogenetic response that doesn't need to be a major, but at least a, you know, a minor or partial, depending on which uh, guidelines you look, followed by the 12 months um, complete cytogenetic response. And in the ELN, um, net, uh, ELN uh, guidelines, there is a suggestion that the achievement of major molecular response can be something desirable for patients with CML, although we still really have a lot of uh, certain controversy depending on uh, the groups that we are studying that. So would you please simplify, what, what does a major hematologic response mean? That's correct. Complete hematologic response, and it's something that we we deal or we have to explain, is the normalization of the, count, the, the counts in the peripheral mm -hmm. blood. Exactly when you really uh, see a patient in the clinic with a CML, most of the time the CBCs are very high, mainly because they are neutrophils and more immature forms, means that these cells have to be less than 10,000, right? Also, it's not uncommon to see a thrombocytosis, elevation of the platelets. These platelets need to be in normal range. And of course, there shouldn't be any mm, blast or immature forms, including basophils mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. eosinophilia in the peripheral blood. Beside that, we're going to complete cytogenetic response. And what is complete cytogenetic response? Is the disappearance of any uh, Philadelphia chromosome from the bone marrow or even in the peripheral blood by conventional cytogenetic or FIS analysis. And the last step is the what we call major molecular response, that is the production on three logarithms from the initial value on the RT-PCR on the patient who has this condition. So that means basically if someone had a million, then you took three zeros away. That's exactly correct. And you always put this, this, this exactly example, right? When you really talk about logarithmic reduction, yeah. you talk, you, you're really counting by, by tens, right? And classically, patient and diagnosis by international standards, they have what we call 100%. And when they have this major molecular response, they have 0.1%. That will be uh, three uh, zeros uh, below. I see. The, the, the question that patients always ask us is, can they work during their treatment? That's a, 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 an excellent question that we have a discussion with our patient. Um, CML, um, fortunately for many of the patients that they are receiving these therapies, is a very, very... Uh, uh, it's a disease that can be treated very effectively and most of the patient can work and can really have a very normal life in a really relatively short period of time. I always recommend that for the first months, two months, three months, patient need to be watched very closely because sometimes mm, uh, cytopenias or myelosuppression, that means that some of the counts can go very low, can occur. This is the reason that I always say, well, you may really watch yourself, see how things go in the first three months, but most of the time this period of myelosuppression is very transient, mm -hmm. and after that, patient can really uh, continue his normal um, you know, uh, work, and he can have a normal life. It is true that in very uh, rare occasions, side effects can be an issue, and of course they need to be addressed by the doctors, and support with medication and in the case that the patient has really a, um, a really bad quality of life because the side effects, well, a change of medication is uh, will be indicated. I see. Is there any way to prognosticate when you first see your patient whether they will do poorly or whether it will be a slow chronic endocrine disease? For many years, since uh, Dr. Sokol in the 80s described his first stratification score, we have, we tried to 
to guess who are the patients who are going to do better and who are the patients who are going to do worse. And it's very interesting because the SOCAL score were described in the 80s as a way to really differentiate who were the patients who need to be transplanted immediately versus the one that can wait longer, right? And based on these criteria that pretty much is age, uh, size of the spleen, amount of blood, and platelets, it's a very easy way to uh, differentiate what are the patients who are low, intermediate, or high SOCAL score. This to me is very important and also has implication in the therapy with tyrosinkinase inhibitor. As low SOCAL score patients, they have very, very low chances to progress to more advanced phase of the disease versus intermediate and high has higher um, risk of transformation. I see. Are there any support groups that you recommend your patients join? Absolutely. I think um, psychological support is a very, very important part of this condition because it's a chronic condition. It's a condition mm -hmm. patients are going to have to deal for the rest of their lives, such as diabetes or hypertension. But in this case, has the, the implication of to be a leukemia and the patients are stigmatized by mm -hmm. the fact they have really a lethal, a potentially lethal disease. And for the reason, psychological support by the family and either or even like a CML support groups are very important. I personally like uh, very much to work with the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, mm -hmm. who provide very nice support. And also, I think uh, it's very under-recognized the, the role of the CML National Society, who really provide local support groups to patients with this condition through the country. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational for you as well.